I don't have an estimate, but the way I look at the budget of Uganda, and I know Ugandans with, with their penchant for exaggeration, I don't think it is possible. I'd be surprised that in the budget of 30 trillion, you can steal 10 trillion and this country functions. So your point is we, we are still stealing too little? I'm not saying that we're stealing too little. I simply want to say that at least we need to have some realistic estimate of how much we lose. The fact that the, a man raped seven women does not necessarily mean that you can say he raped 70. If I may say so that something, I think we already expend a lot of effort on finding out who's stealing what. I, I've seen a lot of duplication of those things. <laughs> so that when I have finished, others can intervene. So yes. Sorry. The first thing I want to repeat. You don't finish. Sorry, grandfather. But I have not grandfather will not finish. Please. Because uh, when enter. grandfather gives a lady a comprehensive report prepared, I think he needs to come up with a strong, with stronger points because in I, that I study. Okay, and, Andrew, uh, Andrew, I'll, I'll protect you here. Please go ahead. By the way, Andrew deserves protection. <laughs> By the time you see Andrew respecting <laughs> others when they are talking, <laughs> you know that uh, he's humble. Let's, let's allow Andrew speak. <laughs> so, so, in fact, Uganda government is government by theft. Corruption is the way the system of Uganda works, not the way it fails. I'm inclined to believe oh, Museveni is just politically posturing. Museveni cannot fight corruption because corruption is how he runs the country. He calls members of parliament, takes them to set house, serves them tea, then pays them off to, to vote. So policemen on the street will collect the money. Uh, people in the hospital may sell drugs. So everyone across the government of Uganda, except those who do not have those opportunities, will indulge in different forms of corruption. And a lot of corruption does not necessarily mean that somebody, of course, has stolen from the government. Because if I go on the road, I'm a police officer, you give me 10K, 10,000 shillings, and I, it's not a theft from government. It's maybe a theft from Mwenda who has made a traffic violation and you have bribed him. So a lot of the bribery that may take place in Uganda also takes place in the private sector, outside of uh, anyone stealing the government resources. So why do I think that Museveni cannot fight corruption? Well, Museveni can use quote and quote, and I'm putting this in quotes, a war against corruption, set of scores with those he doesn't like, or set to score a few political points here and there. But I don't think he can tackle corruption directly the way you see Kagame does in Rwanda. It is, he can't because the system of corruption is a kind of reward system he uses to penalize those who disagree with him, to reward those who support him, or to buy off those who are opposed to him. You need to understand the way the system of Uganda works. He also said he fears them. They are very powerful. Mm. They can bring down so, his government. So, so that is one. That <laughs> if the president of Uganda wants Medadi to cross, he will offer him something, which is access to public resources. But if he wants to reward uh, Timothy, he will give you a, a, Why do people struggle to, for these jobs? Because many of these jobs don't pay a lot of money, but they have said benefits. A lot of these benefits are through corruption. So if he wants to buy off somebody, wants to reward another, or wants to penalize you, he blocks your opportunities from accessing corruption. So the way the system of Uganda is organized, whether you go to Kenya, Tanzania, and all these other countries, really they are uh, organized around patronage, and patronage works through corruption. So that it's the way the system is run. So to remove such corruption out of Uganda is uh, if you attempt to do so, you are likely, you are likely to take away the glue that holds the disparate uh, and, and flabby heterogeneous coalition of different powerful and influential groups, let me say religious groups, uh, professional groups, ethnic groups, all these influential elites. How do you placate their interests? We placate those interests in these poor countries through patronage or corruption. So, so I want to rest on that, to rest that, that the Uganda government cannot fight corruption. What the government of Uganda can do is to try to contain corruption by saying, okay, the public, there is a public outcry, a road was not done, really. Uh, maybe we are going to arrest you on this one. That will be an isolated incident. And maybe that is not politically important or at family level is not well connected. There could be certain considerations. Even by the way, people should not forget, Museveni has also some inf sometimes an interest in penalizing his own relatives because he may want to show that I am impartial in the fight against corruption. So he will get one of his relatives and sacrifice him in this war. So before you challenge him, you trust me, you may see a relative falling 
And you say, okay, <laughs> he will prove you wrong. But it may work for, he would have done it also as a political calculation, not because he's uh, uh, implementing a principle. Now let me tell you what Uganda should do. I think that in Uganda, we hold the stick wrongly. The state of Uganda is organized around a system of what they call accountability for procedures. They have put in place a series of procedures through which government procurement takes place. So if you follow those procedures to the letter, no, you have not committed any wrong. If you violate them, regardless of the result, yes. you, you, you will be penalized. Mm -hmm. So instead of having accountability for results, mm -hmm. my grandson, you are panicking. We still have to, instead of having accountability for results, we have accountability for procedures. Let me give you a good example. You see, this is an iPhone. It is being sold in Fiona's shop. If you follow the government procedures to the letter, crossed every T, dotted every I, and bought this phone for 20 million, you will be rewarded and promoted. Am I correct? You're right. You're right. But if you violated the government procedures and bought the same phone from the same shop, same specifications, for 5 million, mm -hmm. you'll be fired and penalized and even jailed. That system is a disaster. Because rather than fight for corruption, I want to say we want a high quality road and a on a good specifications in this specific period of time at a competitive price. That's the result we want. We, that's, so we will hold you accountable to that result. Of course, it's important for you to follow some procedures, tendering, and all this. But ultimately, we want that result. If you fail to deliver us that result, because it's very easy to establish the cost of a road, it is easy to establish a time frame within which a contractor can finish a road. The third, you, it is very easy to establish uh, the time frame, the quality, and the price. Okay. Right? Now, you look at this road going to my home in Luzira. The, contractor, the contracts were given in 2020. The contract, I think, arrived last year. They have been working on it. I don't see any progress. There is no one who, uh, held accountable. No there is no result. <laughs> we are living in a, a makeshift farm. Have you tried to go to Luzira? So I think that rather than focus on trying to penalize who has not by, uh, uh, this, we need to say, did you produce the right result? Four members of parliament, generally, is this parliament still honorable or dishonorable? Well, it's an honorable parliament, first and foremost. You see, um, I normally ag disagree with the gentleman called Charles Romishana, but one day he mentioned the point that uh, sticks to my mind to date. You may have disagreements with people in parliament today, but don't destroy that institution. Why? Because you will always need it. With respect to the exhibitions in parliament, I will speak less because assuming those things come out to be real, they will have to come before my committee. So I do not want to carry prejudice before I sit in judgment. With respect to cooperatives you have talked about, I think that's where you should applaud parliament first because that's where it started from. It is parliament that investigated, among other people, its own, and made a report, which is the basis upon which action is now being taken. To the extent that the matter is in court, I do not want to speak about the merits, but I think we just need to say, together, we should fight corruption. The summon to the chairperson of the budget committee, the arrest and detention of my colleagues who are currently in parliament are all regrettable, <coughs> regrettable in a sense that as an honorable person, you should be beyond reproach. Even casting doubt on your integrity that you participated in dipping your hand into the teal of the state is bad enough. Even when I know the presumption of innocence, it is something where we need to carry a deep introspection into ourselves, how we run the affairs of government, and where need be reform, and the reform must start with you, the person. It hurts me double. One, because I'm one of the losers of the services 
that ought to be generated from the resources that are being stolen. Second, because I'm a member of parliament, when another member of parliament is said to be dishonorable, I suffer the attendant loss, reputational loss, because everybody looks at me. Those are the ones. I can tell you, Timothy, I started working, teaching at the university on 14th October 2002. Fiona, I don't know where you were. <laughs> I have been working for those 22 years. Hard work. Wake up at five, go to my chambers, do a lot of work, run from court, go to classroom and teach. I used to, 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 to do trading in some, you know, produce, etc., get some little money. When I drive an old car, but seemingly big, somebody looking at me and saying, those are the corrupt of the country who are driving big cars, it hurts me. Therefore, it should strengthen my resolve to join all those that are fighting corruption. We have sufficient legal and institutional framework in the country. What we need to do is uh, to be consistent. Beginning with the head of state, I was wa watching on TV when he was telling uh, the Honorable Betty Kamiya, go slow on the corrupt of this country because you will force them to, to, to invest the money outside. That was a very big statement coming from the head of state whose appointee had just decried the levels of corruption in the country. Today he says, I now have evidence that the corrupt have a, a, a chain from Minister of Finance, State House, and the Parliament. He has started with Parliament without prejudice to the innocence of those that have been arraigned in court, you can say he has started the march. For those that have been summoned to go to CID from parliament, none has come back. I pray for the chairman of the budget committee who you say has now been summoned in the hope that probably for him he will be able to come out of Chibuli. If he doesn't come out of Chibuli, together with the colleagues that are already in incarceration, my prayers to them for justice. And justice means if they committed the offense, may they pay for the sin. If they did not commit the offense, may they come out and enjoy the freedom enjoyed by other Ugandans. Now that the head of state knows of the other players in State House and in, uh, in Ministry of Finance, I'm still waiting also for their summons. For you? For their summons. Uh, those people, well, I expect no summon. The people in Ministry of Finance, the thieves he talked about in State House, I am, I am still doing my research to find out whether the people working in State House and stealing from State House are not his relatives. I am doing my research to establish if they are not his relatives. And if that is not the reason, they have not been summoned. Yet he knows them. Timothy, consistency is a very, very important element in the fight against corruption. There have been allegations against his own relatives. There is somebody who is said to be related to him as an in-law who was convicted on her own plea for the theft of Gavi funds. Convicted on a plea of guilty. Is that person in prison or a minister? So if you and, and I, I remember one day, where these days, when he was trying to go on Twitter then, and he was saying, tell me, just one case, not five, of any person who is known to be corrupt, and I have 
not disciplined. A young man went back on Twitter and said, Your Excellency, very, very respectfully, said, Your Excellency, Honorable Alice Kaboyo was convicted of corruption and she is now a minister. The old man didn't go back on Twitter. I have not seen him tweeting again. So the point is this. Some people say that even these MPs are in prison because they are not related to him. They are not close enough. So, and I don't want to insinuate that they are, he has corrupt relatives. If he has them, I would love to see them arraigned. Finally, the IG, the Inspectorate of Government, all the anti-graft agencies of the state, I really feel for them. Having been chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee for two and a half years, and now Chair Park, there is one cross-cutting difficulty with which all agencies of government are executing their functions. And that is generally classified as poverty. Because when we interrogate them, the cross-cutting plea is, please, work on our budget. I'll give you an example. We make recommendations after analyzing the Auditor General's reports. Do a forensic audit in this. And you know what the Auditor General told us? The capacity of the Auditor General's office to do forensic audits is limited to four reports annually. The financial ability of your country to do forensics. So if you order forensic on Gulu Lira Road, you order forensic on Kanyum somewhere, something road, you do order forensic on Mulago, you are left with one. You cannot do more. Finally, value for money. Value for money audits are very, very important. And uh, taken from where Patricia uh, left, and you, actually you were the one squeezing Patricia to tell you whether they mm -hmm. really meet the value for money standard. Value for money audits would tell us, actually would be the, the redeemer. There are mm -hmm. two redeemers. The first is value for money, and I'll tell you the second. With respect to value for money audits, we have limited financial capacity. We have limited technical capacity. The way government is running these days is people don't touch cash. They don't touch money. It becomes even more difficult for you to trace corruption. Why? Because the man will tell you, I contracted company X to do the road. So did you see me touching money? What they do, we are told, the syndicate, is to work with those people they procure, the contractors. This road is worth 600 billion. Will you, if I give you 800 billion, will you pay me 200 billion? So they wire the money to the contractor's account. If you do not get a disclosure from the contractor, you will not know this civil servant that has gone for the kickback. Okay. The problem of corruption in Uganda is not the, the problem of bad people abusing a good system. No, no, no. It is the way the system is designed and the incentive structure in the system that produces the results that you see. So if you say that you're just going to have a very vigilant system, let me give you an example. When Museveni came here, he's the one who created the IGG. Am I correct? He was the choosing go about and you know, being corrupt their governments, and this one is a million times more corrupt. And I don't think that Museveni is a bad man. I don't think Ruto is a bad man. Or who, you know when they removed the boy, they said, oh, boy was so corrupt. My friend, John Githonga, I worked under him as a consultant for Transparency International. He became the ombudsman. And Kibaki, he brought him in. He was the first man to run to exile that they wouldn't kill him. The thieves were closing in on him. Then people complained, Kibaki, Kibaki, Kibaki left. Ruto came in, corruption went through the roof. Right now, you can see even the kids on the streets burning the town. Things have not changed in Kenya. 
It is not that people in Kenya, whatever they lack um, morals in Zambia, in Nigeria, everywhere. So I don't believe in these procedures of a church. I believe in how do you change the in incentive structure in the way people work, not to eliminate corruption, but to minimize it, or for that matter, to eliminate its negative consequences. Mm. And I think that's where the debate should be. That creating an anti-corruption unit at State House, uh, creating this, creating the other, is, uh, how can I put it? Is a journey to nowhere. The IGG has been there for 500 years since we created it, and corruption has been growing. CID has been there. ISO has been fighting corruption. In fact, I'm inclined to believe that if you want to understand how corruption has proliferated in Uganda, you need to understand anti-corruption institutions. Because, uh, Lydia, it's not true that Uganda does not punish the corrupt. You should know that. If you go to Luzera, you'll find so many public officials rotting there in Luzera. about the preventive now. Yes. So, so I think that how do we engineer the system? Let me give uh, a, a, that a URA official finds it much more profitable for them to, do the right thing. to maximize tax revenue from a, 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 a taxpayer. Because you can go to a taxpayer, uh, does an estimate, the guy is supposed to pay 20 billion, he says you give me 1 billion and pay only 5. You see, mm -hmm. and discounts 14 from the state. Or uh, a union official uh, finds a contractor and the contractor gives them a percentage and you know maybe they take a bid that is very high. Uh, how do you create an incentive structure? Because if you read a person like Max Weber who wrote about bureaucracy, one of the things he argued, modern bureaucracy, this, by the way, the idea of corruption up to the 1900s never existed as corruption in the Western world. In the Western world, using public office for private gain was perfectly legal and normal. So, but the evolution of modern bureaucracy was built on the idea that it is through pursuit of collective goals that the person's personal advancement would be enhanced. So in the previous feudal systems, pre-bureaucratic systems, you directly used your office for personal gain. Now, the new system was to say that uh, your personal growth, whether in income, prestige, and status, will be through the pursuit of collective goals. How was that achieved? By people being offered long-term career rewards. So the more you, you could see the British system, my father was a civil servant of the British system, the more you worked and dedicated yourself to your job, the greater was your prestige, then you get promoted, you're given a career path over time that allows you to grow in prestige, in status, and even, because income is not always the only thing people are looking for, and, that, and recognition. So how do we re-engineer the systems of Uganda mm. such a way that they encourage people to pursue collective goals as a means for them to enhance their own personal prestige, status, and income. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. Reorganizing that structure is something that needs to be debated in Uganda, but trying to punish the corrupt, arresting them, even shooting them. So many countries have tried them. I remember Rowling when he took over power, he lined up five presidents and shot them, former presidents. You see, thinking that he will end corruption, of course, corruption in, Niger in Ghana did not reduce. Thank you very much. Honorable Medet. Well, it's a mouthful um, for me, especially when reference has consistently been made um, to Parliament, first to give information that um, committees of Parliament do not duplicate their work, but we share agencies um, and agree who does what is in the rules. Secondly, we do not uh, review Otajeno's reports on a quarterly basis, but rather on an annual basis. Thirdly, that when we review those reports and make uh, recommendations, which eventually become resolutions of parliament. We follow them through a, a treasury memorandum and eventually if, uh, some, somewhere somehow we coined um, in our rules I think is a triple two action taken points where we demand action taken by the executive. Now when you begin stampeding us to do certain things a certain way you're going to destroy this country. If you're going to be a judge, you've got to be impartial, no prejudice, and do not respond um, to stampede. I think uh, uh, CJ, Katurebe CJ, as he then was addressing Kari Kaihura <coughs> at the death of Joe and Kagezi, when Kari Kaihura said, we told you to allow us 
uh, detain these people without trial for 90 days you refused so now parliament has gotten reason to amend the constitution katrebe cj said made, ref make, made reference to chinoachebe they don't cut that forest because you will need it when you're being pursued do not stampede institutions one to break the law two to react that way i agree that we need to consistently and persistently follow the corrupt undertake preventive measures that we are supposed to undertake Prevent. both in legislation and Prevent. action uh, finally okay yes I, I i also want to make a statement that i am i'm in agreement with everybody who says we should be scrutinized as their leaders as your leaders but as Andrew said, it, actually I think it's Fiona, it begins with us all as individuals at an individual level. If you go to your member of parliament, pressurize him to be the one to build the church, to pay for the dead uh, being buried, to pay for this and this and that, you are somewhere somehow tempting them to engage in these corrupt practices in order to win the next election. So we, the word is let's be consistent in our message by word and action now this business and i think this is where i agree with andrew that yes we need to reward people for the action reward in what terms we have always had a pension system for civil servants that was the purpose do not steal in fear that when you leave your office, you're going to die. We tried it with, uh, he mentioned URA, where we said, oh, these authorities we create, URA, UNRWA, KCCA, give them a lot of money, there will be no corruption. It has not worked. <coughs> we did it with the judiciary, especially the higher bench, and said, okay, let's improve their pension scheme so that when they, 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 they are sure of um, a decent retirement and those who are in retirement are re have retired decently has it eliminated it we continue to receive reports annually that they, they're not doing the best finally let's work on how to manage our finances in a frugal way strategize and prioritize areas of interest we seem to be chewing a lot more than we can swallow that's why the institutions are underfunded, including mm -hmm. these anti-corruption agencies. Okay. Uh, go to the police and ask them, CID, have you investigated this matter? We'll tell you <coughs> no, because the suspect, I mean the, the complainant has not given us money for fuel. We could not go to, to arrest or investigate. It cannot work if you remain perennially broke. <coughs> oh, I had forgotten something on supplementary. I agree with you, Fiona. On supplementary, we have breached the rules because somebody, I mean, even in June, beginning of June, someone brings a, a supplementary. And that's what uh, Patricia was saying. You cannot absorb that money. We give you this money in June, you go, you start advertising for jobs. When are you going to recruit? That's money that goes back to the uh, consultant. Thank you very firm. much. Lastly, Dr. Patricia. Uh, thank you. I, I would like to say here that the Inspectorate of Government is using both the 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 preventive and uh, proactive approach as a multifaceted approach in the fight against corruption. The preventive, we have talked about the strengthening transparency, accountability, and anti-corruption, and empowering the citizens to demand for accountability from an informed perspective. And again, we have uh, used the, the proactive, as in we're investigating and prosecuting cases of corruption, will not, will not abandon that responsibility. And that is the reason why I say the multifaceted approach is the best approach to this. But we, we, I would like to, to, to thank the, the, the listeners and, and citizens out there, because we have seen the role of the citizens in illuminating the face of corruption. Mm. We have seen them bringing cases through social media and approaching our offices and information is flowing faster. So I think the citizens out there are more aware. What we promise to step up is the feedback. 
we need to get to give them the feedback on the progress on what it is we're doing as an institution. Otherwise, thank you very much and have a blessed evening ahead. Thank you. Let me